Welcome to this Ruminant Science Conversation brought to you by Adiseo. Hi, I'm Mike Cropo with Adiseo. I've been with Adiseo over 30 years, and for most of that time, I've provided technical support for our microvit vitamin division. This week's podcast focuses on vitamin A. Now, the whole um, nature of this podcast series is on the transition period in dairy cows, obviously a critical period and a very stressful period. Vitamin A plays a critical role during that period. However, we have to point out that vitamin A nutrition is critical, critically important throughout the cow's life. Um, joining me today is Dr. Bill Weiss. Dr. Weiss is an knowledge expert in vitamin nutrition for dairy cows. He's a professor emeritus at Ohio State University, a prolific writer, published over 150 papers, peer-reviewed papers, and 450 proceedings. Uh, I've had the pleasure of hearing Bill give talks at various nutrition conferences throughout the years, and uh, his uh, knowledge of the subject is unparalleled. Bill also wrote the lion's share of the 2001 section on vitamins in the NRC on dairy nutrition and now co-chairs the 2021 NRC on dairy nutrition. So, Bill, it's my pleasure. Welcome to this podcast. Uh, thanks, Mike. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's always nice and fun to talk about vitamins. Uh, and this is also a, a good time to do this because the, the new NRC, which is now called NASEM, <laughs> but it will always be NRC to me, uh, just came out. And so it includes a, a good review or an up-to-date review on vitamin A and some modifications to their recommendations. Uh, I have just a few slides to help me keep on track here. And, and first thing I wanna talk about is what diets that are not, do not provide enough vitamin A, what are some of the responses? Some are very clearly related to the transition period but other ones can, can occur at, at other, other times. Uh, a sensitive measure of vitamin A status is increased retained placenta, you know, post, postpartum, post-calving. Um, this doesn't mean if, if you're already feeding enough vitamin A, adding more is gonna reduce RPs, no, but if, if you're not feeding enough vitamin A during the dry period and, and the transition period, pre-fresh period, you're at increased risk for retained placenta. Uh, abortions, and not just late-term abortions, but ab abortions throughout the entire gestation period is related to, to low vitamin A. Um, supplementation of uh, vitamin A during the dry period all the way through, through, through calving and into early lactation has been shown to reduce early lactation fre or fresh cow mastitis. Um, and it's vitamin A supplementation in some studies has been shown to increase milk yield which might be related to, uh, to fewer health problems. We know cows that have health problems, especially early in lactation, early in the fresh period, have, have reduced milk yield the entire lactation. So that increased milk might be because of, of uh, better health. One thing not shown here is the importance of, of good vitamin A nutrition prepartum, and this would be all the way from dry cow up through calving, is, is colostrum. Um, colostrum is a major drain on, on uh, the cow's vitamin A, and it contains a huge amount of vitamin A because calves are born without any vitamin A or essentially void of vitamin A, and all their vitamin A comes from colostrum. So good, good vitamin A nutrition uh, during transition and, and into the dry period should help calf health because it improves the, the nutritional value of colostrum. Some things though um, that, that would increase the need for, for vitamin A, and again, in transition and throughout the, the entire uh, lactation cycle, is vitamin A is the least stable vitamin we feed. Uh, it's, it can break down and lose potency during storage and on, with poor storage conditions, we lose massive amounts of bioactivity. So we have to consider that in formulation. It's also the, of the fat-soluble vitamins, it's the one that's sensitive to rumen metabolism. 
vitamin A is is not uh, is almost inert in the room, and we we see some degradation, but not much. But we can lose substantial amounts of vitamin A uh, in the room and through meta through microbial breakdown. So we have to comp uh, uh, adjust for that. But on the other side, we've got to be careful of over supplementation. Um, there's some data showing that uh, tremendous over supplementation of vitamin A can reduce vitamin E absorption. So we don't want to go too far. And there's data now with humans and rats. And I, and I acknowledge a, a human and a rat is not a cow. But we're, they're seeing, finding uh, what, what I, I'd call microscopic lesions or metabolic disturbances at levels of vitamin A lower than what we used to think were safe. So we, we do need to be careful with vitamin A because it is such an a powerful uh, uh, molecule. These are the new new recommendations, and these are um, not what you should feed. These are what I consider where you start. These are good based on good data, uh, and, and and this should be what I'd consider the minimum amounts fed. And and there's good reasons to feed more at various times. Basically, um, the the standard recommendation for for heifers, dry cows, and lactating cows is 110 units per kilo body weight which for a Holstein dry cow and a Holstein pre-fresh cow is going to be about 80,000, maybe 90, 80, about 80,000 units a day. And, the, and that's what they should be fed uh, throughout the entire dry period. And in, tr in the pre-fresh period, uh, intake is going to be lower, so the concentration of vitamin A should be increased. Some changes from the old NRC was uh, the new model has a, a increased supplementation with higher milk production because again, milk uh, contains a fair amount of retinol. So you have to replace what the cow is secreting in, in milk. And it's basically a thousand units of A for every kilogram of milk above um, 35 kilos or uh, in, on pounds, it's about 500 units for every pound of milk above 70, 75 pounds. Now, for free fresh, I say here that the NRC says it's the, the same as the dry cow because there's no ad, ad data indicating benefits of feeding more. And that's true, but it, it, it means you have to feed it the entire dry period and you have to adjust supplementation rates for lower intake in the pre fresh period. There's some adjustments. Some are relative uh, or relevant to, to pre-fresh transition diets. Some are not. As I mentioned, vitamin A is destroying the rumen. And the more starch you feed, the more destruction we see. And if you, you take these are these, and I should mention these adjustments are not in the new NRC. Nutritionists should make these. And for starch, which isn't really relevant to the to the dry cow or the trans, the, the prepartum transition cow, if you're feeding more than 25% starch, you need to increase vitamin A. And based on in vitro destruction, it, I, I'd increase at 2,000 units for every 1% increase in starch. Conversely, I would not decrease it if I'm feeding less than 25% starch. So that, that I don't make a down adjustment but do make an up adjustment if you're feeding high starch. Some things relative or relevant to, to pre-fresh cows or transition cows is the next point there. Pasture is a good source of beta carotene. And if the conver con standard conversion is right, if, if these dry cows or lactating cows are eating a lot of fresh green pasture, uh, you likely don't need any vitamin A supplemental vitamin A, I still would feed some, but you can feed, feed substantially less. But, you know, we don't feed a lot of pasture in, in the U.S. Um, straw, on the other hand, is a very common pre-fresh uh, diet ingredient. Straw has essentially zero beta carotene, um, and it's going to replace typically forages that would have some beta carotene, some hay, maybe some silage. And if you figure the average concentrations of beta carotene in the, the typical forages and then compare that to the zero beta carotene in, in straw, if you're feeding about eight pounds of straw, four kilos, you need to add about 15,000 units to make up 
for the beta carotene that the cow is not eating because of the straw. And again, dry period all the way through, through lactation. And then I mentioned this uh, previously, vitamin A supplements lose activity. And under reasonable storage conditions, if the, the vitamin is in a mix that has trace minerals, you could lose 9 or 10% of activity a month. If it's hot, wet conditions, exposure to sun, those losses can be even greater. So the nutritionist needs to consider, the, to consider loss and incorporate that in his supplementations. So my basic recommendations, I start with, with um, what's now NASEM or NRC. For dry and pre-fresh, a typical, it's going to be 77, 80, let's just round it off to 80,000 units a day throughout that period. And remember, lower intake in the pre-fresh, you have to increase concentrations. Uh, an average lactating cow, 72,000. If my pre-fresh diet has straw, I'm going to add a 15,000 units. So now I'm up to 92,000. There's going to be no starch adjustment uh, for the pre-fresh, no milk adjustment. But there is the risk of storage loss. And I, I think you just, to, to minimize the risk of a deficiency because of storage, I just tack on 20%. And so these dry and pre-fresh cows, if, if you take the average, they're going to be fed about 100,000 units a day. I think that's a good, safe, uh, low risk, uh, both on the high side and the low side. Uh, lactating, if you go through and make adjustments for starch, high starch, maybe high milk production. If it's, these are additive, these are not exclusive, but additive. So you could be up to 92,000, add the, add the adjustment for risk, risk of storage. So again, you're up around this 100,000 units a day for lactating dairy cows. Uh, maybe a little less if they're on pasture. So that's basically the approach I take. Start with NRC and then make adjustments upward. I, there's few, with the exception of pasture or grazing animals, there's no reason to feed less. That's the, the, to me, the, the NRC number is based on good solid data on cow health. So Mike, that's kind of how I, I go. Um, again, those numbers are not a lot different than the old NRC. My adjustments are not in NRC. Those are my own personal adjustments. Um, but that's, that's the approach I take to vitamin A supplementation. You know, Bill, I think you've done a great job emphasizing the fact that uh, vitamin A is susceptible to degradation. And minerals, moisture, heat will all degrade vitamin A. And the rate of degradation will increase dramatically during the summer. So er, people need to be aware of that. It is noticeable and substantial, the differences between degradation in the winter and in the summer. But another point we need to make is that there are differences between the quality of vitamin A from different suppliers, from different sources. And people often overlook that. They think all vitamin A is made the same, and that's not true. Vitamin A is very sensitive to degradation. So one strategy that manufacturers have done to improve stability is to develop a coating that is tough enough to withstand the rigors of degradation, like oxidation, heat, and moisture, but yet delicate enough to be bioavailable to the animal once it gets into the small intestine. Uh, for our viewers that can uh, see the screen, I have a slide here that shows the uh, degradation of three sources of vitamin A, including our product, Microvit A Supra Ruminant, from a mash feed, then it goes through extrusion, and then how much vitamin A is retained after extrusion, and then we store it for three months, and we measure vitamin A from our product and the two competitive products. And then we wait another nine months for 12 months total storage. Now, granted, these are extreme conditions, but it highlights the point I'm making. So at, ma at the mash stage, all three products have 100% of the expected levels of vitamin A. After extrusion, 
microvid A super ruminant loses 20%. You have 80%. The two other products are down to 30% and 20% respectively. So the worst performing product right after extrusion has 20%. That might cause a problem. And after three months storage, it has undergone, undergone another 50% degradation so that after three months storage, there is only 10% left of vitamin A activity of one competitive product, a little less than 20% of vitamin A activity with the second competitive product, and there is 65% left with, the, with our product, Microvit A Super Ruminant. So in this case, under the best of conditions, after three months following extrusion, the very, with the very best vitamin, you'll still lose 35%. Another example of differences between sources is an in vivo experiment. And this was done by Dr. Lee McDowell at the University of Florida about 20 years ago, but it's the only study I'm aware of where they actually looked at levels of vitamin A in the liver of cattle, of steers, fed various sources of vitamin A. So this would be a reflection of bioavailability because these products were not exposed to degradation stressors such as pelleting or moisture or heat. They just fed these products, these various products to these animals. So we had our product and then we had competitive products as well as a negative control. And uh, the data showed clearly that the the sources the amount of excuse me the amount of vitamin a absorbed by the animals and 90 percent of vitamin a is stored in the liver that's why we do the liver biopsies uh that the levels varied dramatically and in this case our product had higher levels in the liver after the first month and those higher levels compared to competitive products was maintained for the following three months so why is that? Well, the key is the coating. We, our Microvit A Super Ruminant is, has a coating that is specifically designed. It's a cross-linked beadlet. It goes through a double, double emulsion process. And this coating is quasi-insoluble. So it does not degrade in the rumen, unlike some other competitive sources. And it also does not break down in the stomach, where obviously the pH is very low. But once it enters the small intestine, it can be broken down enzymatically. So it's the most bioavailable source of vitamin A. And that's been proven time and time again. So Microvit A Supra Ruminant, in my opinion, is the leader in terms of vitamin A uh, sources for the highest quality and the highest bioavailability. I think we've covered the uh, this topic pretty extensively. Um, I want to thank you for your your input. And uh, if anybody wants to learn more about vitamin A in our products, I would urge you to go to our website www.adiseo.com. Bill, thanks again for your time. It was a pleasure to spend same, this time with you. Same here, and thanks, thanks again for the invitation. Thank you. This concludes today's Ruminant Science Conversation brought to you by Adiseo. 